morning. We're glad you're here to worship with us. If you would stand together uh, with us, I just have one brief announcement as we begin our service this morning. Um, we are quickly approaching the summertime, which means that we are, as a church, quickly approaching our vacation Bible school. Uh, it'll be the last full week of, of June here at the church. And so if you want to register your children for that, um, registration begins today out in the lobby. You'll find a table out there with a sign and a computer. You can go there, and there'll be somebody there to, to register your children for Vacation Bible School. We would love to have you join us for that. Well, the Lord is going to call us into worship this morning with his word in Psalm 125, verses 1 through 2. So let me read that for us. It says, Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forevermore. And those two verses talk about two things which occur. Is that the Lord surrounds his people like strong, tall, mighty mountains. And as a result, his people come to more resemble him. We turn from flimsy, wishy-washy, fickle people into sturdy, solid mountains with their foundations deep in the earth. So I pray, church, that as we are surrounded by the presence of the Lord this morning, as he points us to Jesus, may we go from fickle faith into foundations that are deep and rooted in him this morning. Now let's lift our voices and worship him together.
at this time, um, we're going to slow down. And in just a moment, I'll invite uh, a family up for a child dedication. But I just want you to know, we, we've, we've pulled a song from the worship service. We've kind of grabbed this time up with the pastoral prayer. And so we have time to slow down because this is, this is important. I know it's Mother's Day, and so thank you to all of you, those of you who are mothers. I, since we've started streaming the service, my mom watches too, so thank you, Mom, for being my mother. Uh, but I know Mother's Day is often hard, is even when it's good. And at the very end of the sermon, I'll, I'll try and touch on that briefly. For this moment here, I want to kind of go all in on the goodness and the honor that it is of being a mother I've been thinking a lot about the book of Judges lately, and this will be a very strange verse to read in a way at a child dedication ceremony, but but listen to it. I I think you'll see the connection. This is from Judges chapter 2. Verse 10 says, And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work he had done for Israel. This is the community that had come out of Exodus, uh, had come out of Egypt in the Exodus story, into the promised land, through the book of Joshua. And then it says there arose another generation who didn't know the Lord or the work of the Lord that he had done for Israel. And that's a tragedy. The ideal among the people of God is that one generation would take the faith and then share it with the next generation. And if that was the kind of the arc of the story from one generation to the next, generally, how much more so should it ought to be true from one family to that next generation within that family? And so in child dedication, what we try and do is not so much hold up the child to the Lord and say, Lord, would you please love this child? The Lord already loves children. We know that all throughout the scriptures, even when we see the way Jesus interacted with children. What we're doing in child dedication is inviting the family, the parents to say, I want to dedicate myself to training up the next generation, specifically this young child or children. And we're also dedicating ourselves as a church to do the same. So with these thoughts in mind, if we could have David and Carolyn uh, on staff here at the church and Zach and Alana come on up. Just have one in this service. In the other services, we have Liam and Miles Antharapper. We have Eleanor Espenshade, uh, Nora Foster, Davy and Reinhardt, um, Piper Lynn Bechtel, and uh, I'm missing one. <laughs> Who's my other one? What was it? Oh, Jameson. Uh, um, O'Donnell. So they're all 11 children today. Here, if you can come just a little bit more so everybody can see it. If there's any family want to take pictures, you're welcome to stand up too um, in front. Here's a, oh, I'll hand it to you when, yeah. So we would love to hear a little bit from you. Um, and the first thing we'd like to hear is just the, the name of your child and the meaning uh, that it signifies for you both, and then I'll, I'll share a little bit about what next, what you would share next. Uh, so we decided to name her Clara Michelle, um, and Clara, oh, did that frighten you? I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Clara is uh, just an old-fashioned Irish name, so we liked it, um, and Michelle is my middle name. Any other details you want to add? It's okay. Our family uh, is at least 50 percent Irish. So we have Irish heritage, and it's uh, just something that we really stuck out. And originally, it wasn't going to be Clara, and halfway through the pregnancy, it was just like, "Hey, what do you think about this name?" And we're like, "Well, I don't hate it." And then uh, <laughs> it's it's funny. It's funny. Uh, two weeks later, it was just like we really loved the name, so it was it was a no brainer. So I don't know if we said this, but it's it's Zach and Alana. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Sorry, we were supposed to introduce. No, you. that's all right. Zach we're... and Alana Casey. <laughs> So if you could finish the sentence, my hope and prayer for her is. Uh, is for Claire to grow up knowing God um, and uh, live her life knowing God and just knowing church as the community that it is 
rather than just you know something that you do on Sundays. Uh, community has been always a special church for us. Mm. Uh, it's always been more than just a church. It's it's truly been a community. So we just hope and pray that she uh, grows up knowing the same. Yeah. That's sweet. <laughs> I'm gonna set my Bible down. I'm gonna stand in close. That's all right. If and grab her. Whoops. If you wanna hand that to Carolyn. We would love to pray for you guys. Oh, I forgot. Not that. We are not going to pray. We, we are going to pray. But there's something else. I forgot. I'm sorry. Um, we want to lead you through uh, a question as well as the congregation. And so we have a slide for that. I know you can't see the slide. You don't need to. I want to read it to you. But um, because child dedication, we, we think it's um, a wonderful, joyful thing to be a parent. Um, it's also a serious thing. Um, it is a weighty calling that the Lord has on your life to be a parent. And so we'd love to lead you through this um, vow. So it'll be up there, but I'll just, I'll just read it to you um, and ask you this question. So Zach and Alana, will you entrust your daughter to God, to his providential plan and care? Will you commit with the help of this church committee, uh, community to instruct your daughter by word and example in the truth of God's word. If so, say, with God's help, we will. With God's help, we will. And we believe here at Community that uh, children are born into a community of faith. And so uh, we together have a responsibility to bear that in mind. And so there is a vow that we would like our membership to make. And so if you are members of our church, would you stand up? And we want to invite you specifically as members uh, to take part in this. Church, will you commit in partnership with these parents to instruct this little girl by word and example in the truth of God's word? Will you commit to pray for this child that they will grow to love Jesus and trust in him? Will you commit to pray for these parents and encourage them as they face the trials of parenting? If so, please, please read aloud the following. With joy and thanksgiving, as Christ's church, with God's help, we promise to love, encourage, and support you as you follow Christ and train your child in the faith. You can't see this. There's a huge smile up here. <laughs> um, I'm going to, if I can grab just a little finger here. Will you squeeze this? No. And I would love to play, pray for you, Car Clara. <laughs> um, and then we're, if you want to hand that to Carolyn, she would lo we'd love to all pray for you and us at the church. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, I pray for Zach and Alana. I thank you for um, their love for each other that I've seen evidenced over a handful of years they've been here at the church and their, their faithfulness to, to grow in their own maturity in the Lord. Lord, I pray uh, for their daughter. I pray for your hand of blessing upon Clara, and I pray that even as Zach and Alana were saying that their hope and prayer, their highest hope and prayer, would be that she would come to know you and walk with you all of her days. Lord, I pray that you would make it so, that the gospel would be real to her from an early age, and that she would see the love of the heavenly father, and the love of her earthly father, and the love of her mother. We pray all this in Christ's name. Dear gracious Father, you are good, and you are faithful, and you are merciful, and we see your mercies that are new every single day of our lives. Father, I thank you for Zach and Alana and precious little Casey. I know, Lord, that they prayed for her, they waited for her, and you and your gracious love gifted her to them to raise as a daughter of the king. Lord, I thank you for that gift. And I thank you that we as a church can help her grow in her faith and surround Zach and Alana with your love. And Lord, I pray that we would do that well. In your name I pray, amen. 
And Lord, we as a church are so thankful uh, to be welcoming Clara into our midst. And we pray, Lord, that you would give us wisdom and strength, fortitude to, mm. to draw near to the Casey's, that as we see them on Sunday mornings, that we would be mindful of them in their parenting of Clara. As we see Clara grow over the next years, that you would teach us to pray for her, um, for those that are working with her in children's ministry, Lord, that you would um, give them uh, the instruction that they need to give to Clara and that she would find uh, friends here, that she would find brothers and sisters and, and even that she would find fathers and mothers in the faith and grandfathers and grandmothers in the faith. And we can offer that to them and to Clara and we pray that you would help us to do so. By your help, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I hope she's this good all the time. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning. My name is Janice Lilly. This morning's scripture passage is Acts chapter 27, which you can find on page 1073 on the Pew Bibles in front of you. And when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some of the other prisoners so, to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius, and embarking in a ship to Adramidium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. The next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. And putting out to sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus, because the winds were against us. And when we had sailed across the open sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty off of Snidus. And as the wind did not allow us to go further, we sailed under the lee of Crete off Salome. Coasting along it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lycia. Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo in the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete facing both southwest and northwest and spend the winter there. Now when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete close to the shore. But soon a tempestuous wind called the northeaster struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Running under the lee of a small island called Cauda, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Then, fearing that they would run aground off of Sirtius, they lowered the gear, and thus they were driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned." Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have told you, but we must run aground on some island. When the 14th night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. 
So they took a sounding and found 20 fathoms. A little farther on, and they took a sounding again and found 15 fathoms. And fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under pretense of laying out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes and the so ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. As day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day that you have continued in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength, for not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread, and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. Then they all were encouraged and ate some food themselves. We were, all, we were in all 276 persons in the ship. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. Now when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach in which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea, for the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudders. Then, hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach, but striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for land, and the rest on planks or in pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. This is God's word. Well, last week after church, we had a membership meeting, and I just wanted to let you know, in case you haven't heard, that um, the volunteer pastor we were putting forward to the membership to consider affirming, uh, Tony Pitts, as well as the deacon and deaconess, were all overwhelmingly affirmed, and so they're a part of our church in fulfilling those roles now. But I want to mention something else about the meeting. At the beginning of our membership meeting, Scott Elder led us in a brief time of thanksgiving, giving people a chance to share just briefly um, ways they had seen Lord working in their lives, the ways they had seen God's kindness to us over the last year. Some people spoke of God working in our unity when so many things would seek to pull us apart. Others spoke of the health and of our leaders here at church. Others spoke about seeing people or themselves overcoming sin. And it, it was a, because it was such a rich time and because we had to cut it short to move on with our next part of the meeting, what we're going to do is in two weeks, we're going to bring what was that time in miniature and bring it over into the worship services. And so we're going to limit it to just those who are members of our church. But if you want to be thinking about ways that you've seen the Lord um, be kind to you or to us in the last year, when we come to our last sermon in the book of Acts, a study that we've been going through for almost a year and a half about the Lord's kindness um, to his people in the book of Acts, we're going to do that same thing. So I just mention it now. That's not no, normally something we do. But I thought I'd prepare you in advance for it. If you join me in prayer, we'll look at this shipwreck story in Acts 27 together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, a few Fridays ago, there was a tremendous windstorm here, and I felt just for a moment what it would be like to be in a storm that's 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 so big, it's, it's, it's taking huge trees and just tossing them to the ground. And then to imagine what it was like for Paul and these other sailors and to experience that under clouded darkness for 14 days on the ocean, or the Mediterranean Sea, I should say. What a harrowing experience. 
But Lord, you brought them through that storm. And then, Lord, I, the way you went about doing it was designed to show that you're the kind of gods who can bring people through storms. I pray that that would be a truth that encourages us this morning. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. I'm not sure how many of you have been rafting before, whitewater rafting or, or kayaking, but they, they classify rapids in, in, in six categories with class one rapids being the most mild and class six being the most dangerous. And the joke goes that if you go through class six rapids and live, it becomes reclassified as class five. So they're intense. When I was in college, my wife's family, who was my girlfriend at the time, invited me on their summer vacation to Colorado and among the other adventures that we had planned were, were a whitewater rafting trip down the Colorado River, specifically through what's called Gore Canyon, which is full of class four and five rapids. And so we have a picture here. I hope it's in there. If you're able to put that up, look at that. Um, so the guy in the front without the huge arms and no sleeves, that's my brother-in-law, not me, uh, and then behind him is my father-in-law, Bruce, and his wife. And then I'm over there kind of in the purple sleeves, I guess. And my wife's on the other side. Um, you, you, you can put it down. So the previous day before that picture was taken, before Gore Canyon, we had traveled much mild, milder rapids. Um, and the guy that day, it was a different guy than the second day, but the guy the first day looked at all of us at the end of it and said, I don't think you should go on the next day. Um, you're, you're either not good enough or it's too intense, you shouldn't do this. Which, of course, put my father-in-law in this horrible uh, predicament. He hardly slept the night before. And he was so anxious about and worried whether we'd all get hurt. And then we got to thinking about it the next morning. All three of us children, so grown children, at the time, uh, Brooke, Major, and, and myself, were currently Division I college athletes. And my mother and father-in-law were in great shape too. And so right or wrong, we steeled ourselves with the knowledge um, that if we're not fit enough for these rapids, who are they letting go? <laughs> like, are there Olympians from Colorado Springs that are coming over from the training center to go? I, we, we didn't know, but we thought, surely if they're letting anybody go, they'll let us go. So we went. And I'm telling you the story now so you know I didn't die. But um, neither did anybody else. But at one point, we did have a really bad crash, and that's what I wanted to tell you about. Through a series of intense rapids, our guide from the kind of the back of the boat, he's shouting, um, maneuvers for us to, to, to position ourselves more advantageously as we're going through these boulders, and we didn't get in time and place, and the raft slides up on a rock sideways, and this, rather than the water running underneath the raft, which is what is normally happening, the kind of like turned into a taco a little bit, and this channel of water spurted across the top of the raft and immediately threw my mother-in-law into the water. Would you believe no one jumped in to save her until I did? <laughs> um, if everybody else was here, they'd be saying, whoa, 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 that's not exactly how it happened, Benjamin. <laughs> um, the truth of it is that when we went sideways up on to the rock, uh, she was thrown out and I was thrown out and there was no conscious choice about it. Um, it was as easy as just a, a water blowing a leaf off the side of the boat. It, it, it just happened that fast. Didn't matter whether it was an athlete or Olympian. There, there was nobody that was going to hang on. And, and so the story as it keeps going, you know, Bruce did pull his wife back into the raft. But um, first, can you believe that? Before me, I tried not, I was like, Bruce, let me in. And he grabs his wife first. But he grabs his wife, but the, the funny part of the story is he grabs her by the life jacket and throws her into the raft, and her arms were by her sides, and she went face down into the raft and landed between the ribs of the boat and was wiggling like this and couldn't get out. Um, the, it's, all, it's all very chaotic, though. This is happening all at once. It's very funny now. Um, but then the guide yells, Benjamin, look out! And so I turn around, and there's a giant boulder coming at me, and I put my feet out and bounced around, and then they yanked me in face up by my life jacket. We all lived. But I will tell you that when it was over and those set of rapids calmed down, 
Um, we just felt the awe at the power of God in his creation and how small we were compared to it. If you still have your, your Bible open, look at verse 15 in chapter 27 with me. Luke writes that when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. In other words, the wind was so strong that they couldn't help but be blown along. Paul and the other 275 other passengers were carried along irresistibly by the will of the wind. Maybe you've waded out into the ocean before few dozen feet and and you stood where the large waves crash and you've just felt how small and how weak you are compared to huge waves in God's creation maybe there are other struggles in your life right now and it just makes you feel the same way it just makes you feel small it makes you feel fragile as we read this passage, it, it's possible you found yourself confused at various points. That's understandable. Most of us are not familiar with the geography. We read of Sidon and Fair Havens and Cyprus and Pamphylia and Crete and so on. Until it, as we begin chapter 28 next week, we'll learn that they learned that they had crashed on the island of Malta. But where are these places? If I said the answer is basically all across the Mediterranean, that's sort of helpful and Sort of not, because most of us have not spent a lot of time sailing across the Mediterranean. And there are other reasons this passage can feel opaque. There's all these sailing terms. What, what's a foresail? Anybody know? What about the phrase under the lee of? What does it mean to sail under the lee of an island? Basically, it means to, to sail, kind of if this were an island, to sail on this side of it to be protected from winds that were unwanted and dangerous. And so there's lots of deals like that that are hard to understand. But I will tell you this, even with all these potentially confusing aspects of the passage, you saw the big picture, didn't you? In Acts 27, a ship crashes and everyone lives. Or maybe it would be better to say that in Acts 27, a ship crashes and God saves everyone just as he promised he would. And it's here that we get to the main point of the passage. Without the eternal spiritual anchor of Christ, we're just blown about by the storms of life. But with Christ and his promises, we have an anchor that's stronger than any storm. I'd love to walk through every line in the story, but we, we don't have time to go through every section of it, but I want to mention a few of the highlights, or perhaps if you had been living them at the time, you would have considered them the lowlights. But if you have a Bible, just, just, just go ahead and keep it open. I want to refer to a number of verses within it. The story begins in the late fall and early winter of AD 59. Paul is on his way from, it was Jerusalem, then to two years in Caesarea, and now he's from Caesarea on his way to Rome to stand trial before Caesar. We read in verse 1 this. And when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. That word we there, if you want to put your finger on it, it says, when it was decided that we should sail, tells us that Luke, the narrator, was there with Paul as he had been off and on since chapter 16, verse 10. We also learn in verse 2 that Aristarchus, another fellow laborer with Paul in the gospel, was there with them. He's mentioned a couple times in the book of Acts and other letters. Together they catch their first ship, and then later they catch a larger grain ship from Alexandria that's on its way to Rome. Rome had to import ton just tons, literal tons and tons of grain into its city to feed all of the people. And so this was a ship coming from Alexandria to bring grain there, and they hitch a ride. I, I sort of take this to mean it would be like you and I if we wanted to fly to San Diego. First, we have to get on a small plane and go to a hub city, and then we ca from that hub city, we can go to our destination. That's what's happening here, and they make a few stops on the first ship and then some more on the other ship, but the sailing keeps getting harder 
and the winter weather gets worse. Let me read verses 10 and 11. Paul says, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot, can you believe it? And the owner of the ship than Paul, uh, than to what Paul said. You can see that the difficulties beginning to pick up. Paul, Paul's, who, well, you know, it's just missionary Paul, just prisoner Paul. He is a seasoned traveler. He's spent thousands of miles already on the Mediterranean Sea. So he knows something of what he's talking about here. And in the late winters, you did not want to be caught in the middle of the Mediterranean. These are not class two rapids anymore, we might say, but class four and class five. And yet the crew wants to press on. They figure we're division one sailor. We got this. And the storm gets worse and humbles them and brings them to the point of throwing their gear overboard to lighten the ship in the hopes that that will keep them afloat. Look with me at verse 20 at how bad it gets. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest lay upon us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. That word for abandoned there used in verse 20 is the same word in the Greek that's used in verse 40 when the sailors say, quote, they, they, they cast off the anchors, they abandoned the anchors and left them in the sea. The point of verse 20 being this, they're essentially saying it was so bad, just as we've tossed our gear overboard, we might as well have tossed all hope overboard. It's that bad. Then Paul gives a speech in verses 21 through 26. It goes like this. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not set sail from Creed and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of God to whom I belong and to whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. And I just think about how he would have lift, had to lift up his voice over the noise of the storm and the wind and the waves. And he had been shouting to the sailors on board through the darkness saying, So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on some island. I don't think his, you should have listened to me at the beginning of his speech, was simply a way to say, I told you so, although it sounds that way. Instead, Paul wants them to listen to him now. He, he, he's building a case not only on his trustworthiness, but especially God's trustworthiness. He wants them to know what Jesus has promised him, and not only him, but all of the sailors. And after two weeks of storms, they get close to the land. I won't reread these verses again, but, but I'll just summarize them to say that when they get, start to get close to land, they're kind of laying anchors out the front of the boat, or maybe it's the back of the boat, if we forget the detail how it was going. But at the opposite end of the boat, there's, uh, or excuse me, the ship, there's a small lifeboat, and all the sailors try to get on that boat and sneak away while they're laying anchors on the other side. Paul sees this happening, goes over to the centurion and says, hey, if these guys get off the boat, we can't be safe. Which is a fascinating insight into Paul's view of God's sovereignty and human responsibility. Like God's going to save them, but we need the sailors. <laughs> like, can you, I, mean, I mean, we don't think about boats like, oh, can you just land a boat? Like, think about it more like an airplane and no one knows how to fly an airplane. It's like that. And the pilots, you know, put on, you know, they like get to the front of the cabin and they're strapping on parachutes. That's what's going on here. Basically, what happens after that, after they cut away the lifeboat, is that they point the ship towards land and, and, the, and they brace themselves to swim for it. I think an equivalent might be just for us to picture it would be like um, us riding in a huge van or a bus and, and the, the driver of the bus takes a cinder block, puts it on the accelerator, ties a bungee cord 
to the steering wheel, and then everyone climbs to the roof of the bus and just kind of gets ready to jump. Like, that, that's how committed they are. Once you've cut away the anchor, once you've cut these sails away or pointed them in this direction and, and just, you know, kind of put the rudder in a place where it's just going to go one direction, like, you're not salvaging anything except for hopefully your own lives. The prisoners um, are worried because then those soldiers who are in charge of them are like, well, maybe we should kill the prisoners because if they get away, then we'll lose our own lives. The centurion, as he has, and really has Rome has throughout this experience for Paul in jail, has looked out for him. They saved them. And then we come to the final line of the passage. Would you look with me at that? It's the very last part of verse 44. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. Somehow they all lived through class six rapids. And they shouldn't have lived. Like that, that's the point of this story. Every sailor, every soldier, every prisoner would, would have turned back and looked at the ship just being destroyed by the waves as they stood on solid ground and go, I, I shouldn't be alive. Like there, there is no way I should be alive right now. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 to the disciples, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I would say one of the reasons the book of Acts is written is is to show forth the truth of that statement by Jesus. The book of Acts is written to show Jesus keeps his promises. The book of Acts is written to show that Jesus builds his church. But sometimes I look at this story and other stories and I think about what it feels like for Jesus to build his church and I wonder, why does it have to be so hard? I mean... If the storms are this violent and the waves this fierce, aren't we doing something wrong? Just consider for a moment all the words and phrases in this chapter that describe the difficulty. Quote, because the winds were against us, verse 4. Arrived with difficulty off Sindus, and as the wind did not allow us to go further, verse 7. The voyage was now dangerous, verse 9. The harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, verse 12. Soon a tempestuous wind, tempestuous wind called the Northeaster, struck down from the land, verse 14. We managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat, verse 16. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo, verse 18. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay upon us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned, verse 20. Since they had been without food for a long time, verse 21. And we must run aground on some island, verse 26, and so on and so forth. It's really hard. The author of Hebrews says that in Jesus Christ, We have, quote, a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. Hebrews 6, 19. We have a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. Paul sure did. I think this passage is written in such a way, and it unfolds in such a way to remind all Christians that we have one too. Jesus Christ and his promises are an anchor stronger than any storm. That's the point of the passage. I want to close by by reading again verses 24, 25, or 23, 24, and 25. Look with me again at these words from Paul as he speaks to those who are storm-tossed and weak. Verse 23, for this very night there stood... I'll just pause for a second. Acts chapter 23, verse 11. Paul's in jail at night, and it says that the Lord stood by him. 
and promise you're going to get to Rome. Here again, only imagine Paul's faith. He's wavering 14 days. They can't, the sailors don't even know where they're at. It's that dark. They can't see the stars. They can't sail. Yeah, they're not using their GPS because they didn't have one. For this very night, there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. That play on the word stand. I'm standing before you now. You're going to stand before Caesar. It's going to happen. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you, the angel tells him. So then he turns and looks at the men and says, Take heart, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. In the storm, Paul has confidence in God Because he knows he's become God's own treasured possession. Did you see the way he put it? The God to whom I belong, he says. It's not just that that Paul reaches up and he's got God with his faith. It's that God reaches down and says, I've got Paul. Every Christian can say this same truth. It's not simply, I have God, but God has me. God has us. And notice that the miracle that God performs was not done for Paul alone. God wants an audience to behold his saving power. God wants others to know that he can be trusted to save. That's that's the way the passage and the shipwreck and the storms and the prayer and all of that, this message from the Lord in the light, the order of all of those and the way it's all done is designed to speak not just to Paul, but to that audience and this audience. First, God humbles them with a storm they can't handle, despite being Olympian sailors. Then God has a Christian make a speech and pray, all visible to them. Then God saves them dramatically from something there's no way they should have been saved from. God designed everything about this salvation story to unfold, not just to get Paul, but all of the sailors and soldiers to witness God's saving power. In other words, far more important than Paul being on missionary journeys throughout the book of Acts is the fact that God is on missionary journeys throughout the book of Acts. Which leads me to say to you, behold, behold God's saving power. Anyone who wants to be can become God's possession and have God's promises to them, have an anchor for their soul Stronger than any storm. We only have to ask. As sweet as Mother's Day is, I know some of you mothers are in a storm. You can feel the wind, feel the waves. Just wonder, are we going to make it? Some of you women want to be mothers and aren't. And that's part of the storm. There are other kinds of storms. A pastor friend tax, texted me last week and in this, this long paragraph where he speaks of his wife's struggles not to hate the church after all that's happened to them. In his own struggles in faith, he wrote to me, I'm just trying to understand my identity in Christ when everything else is being taken away. Same week, another pastor friend texted me another long text message and said, that he had just left the single hardest meeting he'd ever been a part of. He wrote, quote, I started having a panic attack in the middle of it. I was literally shaking. The pastor ended his text message to me by describing his church situation this way. It feels like we're on the brink. It's like the Cuban Missile Crisis. I read these kinds of texts and I wonder why the building of Jesus' church is so hard. God has his reasons, we can be sure. 
Maybe you feel like you're in your own class six rapids. Your own 14 day storm, your own brink, your own crisis. I, I want you just as we close, just, just grab one of the hundreds of promises from Jesus I could have read. I just grab one. I'd love you by faith to bring this promise near to your heart. Let it be an anchor for you. Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 18, I have said these things to you, to his disciples, which they were then to send to say to others and then to be inscripturated for us so that we could have them too. Jesus said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. I have overcome, we might say, the storm. Let that promise and the others like it be an anchor for you in the storms. Would you pray with me as we invite the worship team back up? Lord, it would have been terrifying to have been on that ship with Paul. And to stand on the land with Paul, there would have been another kind of fear. The fear that the Bible describes as awe and wonder and reverence at your saving power. Lord, I pray that in the midst of whatever storms my brothers and sisters, friends, those who are visiting here this morning might be experiencing. I pray that you would speak your peace over their lives. And whether the storm itself continues to rage, I pray that in their hearts, in our hearts, we would stand firm on your promises. We pray this in Christ's name. Would you stand with us? Would you sing with us this song? Um, about the Lord's control and lordship even in the middle of the storms. Let's sing.
darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand. words of comfort as you go today. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Amen. As you go from here today, uh, there will be several people up front that will be um, willing to pray for you if you have anything you'd like to, to come and pray about. We would love that and welcome that. You're dismissed.